like to acknowledge the Kwandamuka people and elders past and present on whose uh, island I have the pleasure to live, work and play with my partner Trish. IWD is usually a time to celebrate the lives of women and their successes against the power of men to control and limit our freedoms. However, as a lesbian, I have mixed feelings each year on IWD. I find it's a time where I mourn the minuscule amount of information and the loss of history about the accomplishments and contributions of so many ordinary lesbians, not just for lesbians, but their contributions for all women and the broader society. And I can get really angry about how the energy of lesbians has been cynically used by LGBTQ organisations. By the way, many have dropped the eye in political campaigns and on IWD, campaigns which are not in our interests. And then to be aggressively denounced as bigoted and transphobic when we insist on our right to be totally uninterested in male bodies. But today I want to look around the world a bit to honour some women whose lives have been overlooked and in some cases even revised. I can be inspired by their achievements, their path-making first, their quiet lives, as well as their resistance to be diminished by others. As we face down an authoritarian ideology currently redefining sex and sexual orientation in the industrialised world, the challenges of these lesbians and the ones they took on and their strategies, I think, can help us build more communities of courage. Firstly, Christabel Pankhurst. Christabel was a lesbian and the eldest daughter of Emmeline Pankhurst, who founded the Women's Social and Political Union Group in 1903. This was the first women-only activist organisation fighting for women's votes. Christabel developed a new strategy of militant direct action with the motto, Deeds, Not Words in 1915, uh, 1905, when the newspapers lost interest in covering their meetings and articles. She took the first direct action by heckling a politician and spitting at a policeman in order to be arrested. And when it came to court, she refused to pay fines and was sentenced to prison. This caused a national and international uproar it was the press coverage they wanted to highlight the campaign. Christabel recognised the importance of media coverage to raise awareness, and many women were attracted because of their defiant tactics. She had to flee to Paris in 1912 after another warrant was issued and after she'd served a number of prison terms and had been force-fed in, in the prisons. From Paris, though, she was able to continue leading the WSPU and editing the UK suffragette newspaper because members went across the English Channel every week to get instructions and editorial content from her. She went back to England when war broke out. However, male historians like Dangerfield argued that the militancy of the suffragettes was motivated by lesbianism and sexual frustration. <laughs> Mitchell characterised the suffragettes as demented lesbians and ferocious spinsters who really just wanted to be raped. All these male historians aim to belittle feminists and any women's political movement through insulting and accusing them of being lesbians. The tactic has not died. Dame Joan Hammond. She was born in New Zealand but arrived in Sydney at two months old. She had an exceptional artistic, musical and athletic talent. She was an outstanding golfer, winning many championships including state titles. It's not a common talent amongst world opera singers. Her 1941 recording of the Puccini aria, Oh My Beloved Father, was the first classical aria to sell more than a million records anywhere in the world. Now on a trivia night, you might be asked that question <laughs> and you would probably guess it was an Italian tenor, but it wasn't. It was Dame Joan Hannon, Hammond. 
She was also the first woman ever to be granted royal permission to sing in the chapel at Windsor Castle. Sadly, nearly all her personal papers and memorabilia were lost in the Ash Wednesday fires in 83, when the house that she and Lolita Marriott lived in was destroyed. Her relationship of more than 40 years with Lolita was an open secret amongst the musical circles. However, in 1996, her obituary in the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age said simply, she never married and did not mention Lolita. Wikipedia also repeats this, writing of her death, she never married. It's true in the heterosexual world, sort of, but happily, Joan died after Lolita and her headstone acknowledges Lolita as her loving companion. Barbara Giddings and, we're in the States, and Kay. Barbara moved to the US from Vienna when she was 18. She failed college because she spent so much time researching, trying to research and find out more about homosexuality in the library. She missed too many classes. But it started her love affair with books. She founded the New York branch of the first lesbian civil rights organization Daughters of Bilitis in 1958. And it, she was instrumental in shifting it from a secret social group to a, physical, a visible political one. She, she picketed US government offices, the top photo left, uh, the White House and the Pentagon in 1965 to protest the ban on lesbians and gays in federal employment. These were the first public lesbian and gay rights demonstrations. Her partner Kay was a photographer, so we're lucky to have a record of so much of her activism. In 16, 1963, she realised that as long as doctors pathologised homosexuality, changing attitudes would be difficult. So when on TV in 1971, the host claimed, there is a great body of medical research which regards homosexuality as an illness. Barbara fired back. Homosexuality is not the problem. Your attitudes towards us are the problem. The real sickness is the hatred of homosexuals. The only thing that is wrong with, with it is that you people are upset about it. What are you upset about? It's a, it is the supposed science that you have to question. The parallels with today are quite obvious. Again, Barbara organised pickets, this time at the annual American Psychiatric Association Conference in 1970. First year they picketed, in the next year, Kay and other activists and Barbara infiltrated the meeting, shouting, psychiatry is the enemy incarnate. Psychiatry has waged a relentless war of extermination against us. The audience was shocked to find themselves being labelled oppressors. The next year, and the photo at the bottom is of that next year, the next year Barbara Kay and Kamini, a gay man, organised a panel to discuss psychiatry, friend or foe to the homosexual. They knew they needed a psychiatrist as well and they invited a recently sacked psychiatry professor after he was outed. To try and protect his career, he came in disguise with a wig and a Richard Nixon face mask. You can see him. Yeah. And used a voice distorting microphone. <coughs> We have to proclaim that in the absence of valid evidence to the contrary, we're well, healthy people. We are not sick. The next year, the APA voted to sort of remove homosexuality from the DSM, the same DSM that uses gender stereotypes to pathologise children. And it didn't completely disappear until 1987. Throughout she and Kay worked tireless, tirelessly to get more books on homosexuality into libraries across the US. 
Barbara unsurprisingly became the coordinator of the Gay Caucus within the American Library Association in 71. To advertise their first lesbian and gay bibliography, they went to the um, annual convention. People ignored them, no one wanted their leaflet, so they did one thing that was not at all concerned with libraries. They set up a same-sex kissing booth. <laughs> it was the first ever gay kissing booth. But nobody wanted to take part. So they did the action themselves. The four of them kissed and embraced each other for two hours. <laughs> it made the six o'clock news. Storme, a lot of you will have known about Storme. It's well, she's well known amongst lesbians for her part in the Stonewall Uprising, which is usually credited as the birth of the gay and lesbian rights movement. But as you just heard, Barbara Kay and others were actually laying the foundations of that movement at least 10 years earlier. Stonewall the night, nightclub was owned and run by the Mafia and therefore subject to frequent police raids. Storme was a black lesbian who early on was a drag king, entertainer and a bouncer. And up until her 80s, she patrolled the many lesbian bars and nightclubs in Greenwich Village in New York. She was loved and known in the community as a fearless guardian of lesbians and their spaces. So I want to set the record straight. Storme, a coloured butch lesbian, was responsible for starting the first Stonewall riot at 1.20am on June 28, 1969. In her words, a cop said, move along faggot. I think he thought I was a boy. When I refused, he raised his nightstick and clubbed me in the face. He shoved me and I instinctively punched him in the face. He went down. <laughs> After a long struggle, Storme was dragged into a paddy wagon and yelled, why don't you do something? It was then that the crowd surged and started attacking the police with whatever they could find. She needed 14 stitches in her face. Storme didn't claim any credit until 20, uh, 2008, when really pushed in an interview by Patrick Hines. He asked, have you heard of the Stonewall lesbian? The woman who was clubbed outside the bar but never identified? Storme nodded and then said slowly, yep, they were talking about me. Despite the evidence, in 2018, the National Centre for Lesbian Rights about, and in their literature about the Stonewall rights, did not acknowledge Stormay's involvement in the uprising at all. Then, in 2019, Eileen Miles, a trans woman and self-proclaimed lesbian, wrote an article called The Lady Who Appears to Be a Gentleman. The article uses he, him pronouns throughout, Stormay's close lesbian friends and her carer objected to Harper's Magazine changing her very identity after her death and requested a correction and an apology. Harper's Magazine refused to print a retraction or an apology because they supported the author's claim that he was Stormay's chosen pronoun. Now this Miles article is used by other trans writer, writers to justify calling Stormay a lesbian, just by calling Storme trans and he. If we can be revised after we've died, by the very thing that we're fighting against, what are we fighting for? Phyllis and Francesca. They are many things, researchers, writers and partners of more than 50 years. They are the first lesbian couple to appear and to be interviewed on Australian television. It was in October 1970 on the ABC's This Day Tonight program by Peter Couchman. After the Stonewall Uprising, the ABC wanted to inform the public about lesbianism by interviewing some of them. They reluctantly agreed, someone had to do it, and they had founded the first Daughters Abilities group in Australia in Melbourne, some nine months early before camp was formed in Sydney. As you can see by the still photo, 
from the program, they were quite ill at ease and totally unprepared for how invasive and direct some of the questions were. Their TV appearance increased the membership though. Last year, Phyllis, who's the one on the right of screen, sponsored the Basque Coast, Basque Coast Prize for Nonfiction, one of the richest competitions for nonfiction in Australia. The ABC is screening a documentary next week called Why Did She Have to Tell the World? And so I'll leave it to you to discover more things about these two uh, wonderful women and their activism. Marlene. Marlene, from the Netherlands, is the first female director to win an Academy Award. Although most commentary will claim and state that it's Kathleen Bigelow who was for the first female director in 2010. But in 1996, film, Marlene's film Antonia's Line won the best foreign language film. She had written the script back in 88 and she had directed the film with her partner Maria as her first assistant. Antonia's line tells a story of a matriarch and her ever-expanding family over a period of 50 years with an artistic and cheerful feminism as it goes through trends, fashions, drama and fads. Can I just say, where's Susan? Susan, would you like to just comment on Antonia's line? Well, um, Antonia's line is, I only vaguely remember it, but, but it was the question of silence. Uh, which I think might have been her first film. Yep, question uh, of science. Which was extraordinary, and I remember sitting yeah, in the movie theatre, all yep. the women were laughing and all the men were just laughing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the male critics, it's, a, it's still available, and I really urge you to watch it. It's a fantastic film. Still very relevant. Male critics, however, as <laughs> Susan has alluded to, slammed the film for being a humorless feminist rage as all the male characters were too boastful, stupid or malevolent. <laughs> and Tony's line is less confronting than her first film, A Question of Silence, in which three women strangers brutally murder an unknown man because patriarchy had pushed them to the edge. In the court scene, when the judge states the court will treat these women as it would men charged with the same crime, all the women laughed at him. Marlene also directed Mrs. Dalloway based on Virginia Woolf's novel and showed that movies exploring complex feminist themes can be sex successful at the box office and Antonia's line was extremely successful. This is a collective because I want to mention on IWD, we need to acknowledge an ongoing, ongoing grim reality. While we in wealthy, predominantly white countries are fighting to have our same-sex relationships respected in law, language and policies, there are lesbians, a lot of them elsewhere, being imprisoned for life and tortured for loving women, as Susan has referred to. Same-sex relationships between women are illegal in 70 countries still. And seven, including Saudi Arabia, have the death penalty. The laws are about same sex, not same gender identity, as the laws have been changed in the definition in this country. So there's a steady stream of lesbians fleeing for their lives, mostly to European countries, but even in these countries, only around 35% are granted asylum. The rest are deported unjustly because their stories don't fit a Western lesbian coming out narrative, or the judge thinks that they can go home and live safely in the closet, or that they have been previously in a forced marriage and ought to go back home. These people have no idea. It's also horribly ironic as we demand an end to the many harms inflicted on children by the medicalization of their unconventional behaviour and interests, lesbians in Iran are offered full gender transition as an option to being flogged and imprisoned. It is often families 
who report their lesbian relatives to authorities. It's a chilling parallel to the Tavistock clinicians' observations in the UK that a number of parents transition their unconventional children because they do not want a lesbian daughter or a gay son. The dark joke amongst those clinicians was, in a few years, and I quote, in a few years' time, there will be no lesbians or gays left. These refugee women warn us that it is a myth that lesbian rights are basically secured. And all the rainbow flag waving and exclusionary pride marches obscure very uncomfortable truths. We need to look both inside and outside our particular interest to recognise the centrality of authoritarian propaganda to maintaining the levels of lesbian persecution and how much is at stake for all women. <coughs> Finally, Kira. Kira shattered numerous myths about being f female and same-sex attraction, attracted. She has laid pavers on the pathway to resist the attacks on women and girls' sex-based rights by resisting male power in government agencies and by corporate capitalism. Kira created the first steps on the collective pathway to dismantle medicalising children who reject sexist stereotypes. She did not take the individualist route of claiming financial damages for herself. Like Christabel, she's shown the value of publicity in taking a public stand against the power of institutions. Like Joan, she's provided inspiration by being the first and known globally. Like Barbara, she had the courage and self-knowledge to challenge accepted wisdom and to show the importance of science and evidence to change harmful practices. Like Storme, she was motivated to protect others and use her language to call herself a butch lesbian. Like Storme, she's a survivor helping other people survive. Like Phyllis and Francesca, she showed the courage to step into the spotlight in a very hostile institutional and cultural environment. And she showed the transformative power of personal storytelling. Like Marlene, her experiences highlighted the harms of patriarchal propaganda about women and girls and the importance of girls to be able to live free of sexist stereotypes and particularly the male gaze. Like lesbian asylum seekers, she reminds us that as a woman, it is same-sex attraction, not gender identity, which is central to having your basic human rights ignored or denied. Finally, Kira's case has shown the world yet again that medical experts do not stand outside the ideological interests of corporate capital or governments dependent on it. It has exposed how damaging propaganda has gained significant institutional and social power and how it operates against the material, cultural and political interests of women and girls. Kira, by approaching the highest court in the land, has absolutely shattered the myth that lesbians and young people are not harmed by gender identity ideology and its practice of gender affirmation. As Jennifer Billick said, resistance may prove to be the greatest love story ever told, the expression of love for all those who suffer harm and justice. I want to say thank you, Kira, and all the lesbians for your courage to widen pathways and to write chapters in the Book of Resistance, a book that helps all of us to build communities of perseverance for women's liberation and sisterhood. Thank you.